Welcome in. Oh. And now, welcome into Facebook Live for Pressbox Live. And uh, I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Pressbox and PressboxOnline.com. With me is my co host, Gary Stein of Studio 83. Gary, how are you this evening? Rushed and flossed and ready to go, Stanley. You do look. I can see that you flossed. We're going to introduce <laughs> in just a second. He's a good friend of both of ours. But I want to tell you first that Pressbox Live is brought to you by. C3 American Exteriors. Go to their website at c3america.com to get a brand new roof for just the cost of your insurance deductible. Welcome in. As I said, I'm Stan the Fan Charles. Gary Stein is with me. And that gentleman also with us is a good friend of both of ours. He's an esteemed author, former advertising executive. He wrote just a couple of years ago, he wrote the book, Collision of Wills. There you go. The story of Johnny Unitas and Don Shula and the rise of the modern NFL. But he's on tonight, even though we'll talk to him a little bit about the book, that book. He's got a new book here, and it's a book that will come out, Jack, um, before we mention what it's about. It's coming out in 2022, I think. It'll I think so, out. yeah. Okay, but it is... You've pretty much finished your end of the writing of this book about Spectacular Bid. Yeah, it's about Spectacular Bid, probably the fastest racehorse that ever lived. And uh, I wrote, I've written the entire manuscript. I started writing it while, before Collision of Wills even delivered. And uh, the manuscript's complete. It's with the publisher. And uh, it's on its way to the market soon. What intrigued you about Spectacular Bid? I mean, look, first of all, your first novel is kind of a historical novel. I'm, I'm not novel. First book is a historical book from events that took place in the 60s and 70s. This also goes back to 1978, 79, and the rise of Spectacular Bid and sort of the, you know, the plummeting of him at the uh, 1979 Belmont Stakes. Yeah, well, Spectacular Bid, what, what interested me in the story was uh, the Spectacular Bid's jockey was a teenager, a young kid from, from uh, Dundalk who had, you know, he grew up in an urban atmosphere. Anybody from Baltimore knows what Dundalk is like. It's a, it's a suburb, but it's a, it's a tough place. It's a city unto itself, kind of like what Brooklyn is to Manhattan. And uh, so he was 15 years old when he went into Pimlico. He had dropped out of uh, high school. He was not uh, academically inclined. And probably what we would say about a guy like that today is he probably had ADHD or something like that. He couldn't sit in his chair and he got picked on a lot because of his size, but he was clearly a great athlete. He played on the base of the varsity baseball team there, although he was put in really to be like an Eddie Goodell type of figure. If they needed a base runner, they'd put him in to draw a walk or that kind of thing. So he, uh, but he was really a very strong guy. Everybody noticed it. And uh, so he quit school. He's working at the Roy Rogers. You know, his father's worried about him. He doesn't know what to do with him. His dad drives a forklift at the old American Can Company. And, um, and then his father's best friend lives down the, the row, you know, lives down the street in one of the row houses from them. And uh, he sees Ronnie out there fighting huge guys. And he says to himself, you know what? That kid would make a hell of a jockey because he saw how, you know, he had the ideal size for a jockey and he had the heart of a tiger. So he yeah, takes him. So you, takes came him at, you came at this project from a different angle. It wasn't the horse that fascinated you. It was partly the jockey's story. Well, yes, it's it's all of them, really, which I'll go into in a second. But but the reason I bring up the jockey now is because by the time that I came to this story three years ago, he was lying in a East Baltimore hospice and he was getting ready to die, barely older than I am right now, of lung cancer. And so uh, somebody that I knew knew him well and called me up and they said, do you remember Ronnie Franklin? And I said, sure. He's, well, he's, he's about to die. And right. I'd like to see if you'd write about him. I said, ah, I'm not interested in that story because right. Ronnie, he went to, to be a jockey at 15. He won the Kentucky Derby in the Preakness at age 19. And he was washed up three weeks later. He, he got caught with cocaine and it was 
you know, he hung on for a while, but it was essentially over. The glory days were already over before he was 20. So, but, you know, I, I came around because of course the, the bid was, if there was ever a horse as talented or maybe even more so than Secretariat, it was spectacular bid. It was right there, yeah. I mean, he was- So, great, but Jack, it's interesting. Records. I'm sorry, Gary, please go ahead. That's all right. So, Jack, I, 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 it's funny you mentioned that right then about him and Secretariat, because two minutes ago in this interview, you said that Spectacular Bid was probably the fastest horse ever. And I was going to ask you about that because Secretariat was is widely known as the greatest horse ever. So how would you justify that comment vis-a-vis -vis Secretariat? He was breaking Secretariat's records for speed all over the place. And he was uh, in, in one of his earliest major races was at something called the Laurel Futurity, which was held at Laurel Racetrack. It's an important uh, race two -year for two-year-old. It's which, a two-year-old prep, yeah. It's a two-year-old prep, and but it's for really very high-quality two-year-olds. And it's a high-paying race. It's a big deal to win it. And uh, so now, remember, Secretariat came around in 1973. So I guess that was 1972 for Secretariat when he was there. And, uh, and Spectacular Bid broke his record time at the Laurel Futurity. So they knew right early on, they're like, wow, this guy, this horse is a very big deal. So mm -hmm. what was crazy was, is that both the Bid and the Kid were both trained in horse racing at the same place at the same time a highly unusual thing. They were both trained at the Middleburg Training Center in Middleburg, Virginia. And, uh, and uh, Ronnie went down there to learn how to be a jockey. And he was riding spectacular bid as a, as a yearling, as a colt. And nobody knew what he was at that time. Nobody yeah. knew what Franklin was at that time. It was just amazing that they, that they had been together from that point on. Jack, give us the context of the, and we'll talk about spectacular bit in the story in a minute, but give us the environment, give us the context of horse racing back in the 1970s. You know, a lot of our viewers right now may not even know the history of racing back in the 70s. I mean, certainly there have been periods of great times of racing, you know, over the course of time. The 1970s was clearly one of those times. Well, and not since. There's never been anything like it since. There's never been any kind of a prolonged era like the 70s. Um, you know, there had been some great racing prior to the 70s, as you're alluding to, like Sea Biscuit and, and uh, War Admiral. And, you know, uh, there had been some great horses that had come down the, the pike, including Native Dancer from here at Sagamore Farms and, and others. But but the 70s was really maybe a high water mark or a golden age of, of racing. I mean, in Baltimore, it looked like the 70s would be desultory, you know, it, it kind of shabby because Pimlico uh, is, is one of the oldest sports venues in America. It goes back to the 1800s. It predates Yankee Stadium, I think, by like maybe half a century. Mm. It was already a major sports venue for years before Yankee Stadium came. And uh, its signature piece was this gigantic, beautiful old clubhouse, which uh, was more beautiful than the spires at Churchill Downs. It was a beautiful backdrop for, for the photography of racing. And uh, uh, it was really magnificent. But in 1966, I think, and maybe Stan knows better than I do, it burned down to the ground. I, and, went, there, uh, it, I went there that night. We heard, and I lived about mm. half a mile from Pimlico racetrack, maybe a mile. And it was a spectacular fire, right, Stan? It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And and the building, I mean, when it went came down, I mean, the only thing I could liken it to for a city is it was when uh, Notre Dame Cathedral burned down in Paris. I mean, I I don't think that many contemporary Baltimoreans understand it, but a huge part of the ego of this city was in that building. I heard Ooh. that the or the the old Oriole Park you know, that burned down like on July the 4th, like 1948 or 51, so 48 or 49. I heard that was a remarkable fire, you know. A remarkable fire, but not a remarkable building. No, exactly. The, the old clubhouse was a remarkable building. And not yeah. only that, but it was it was the Canton, Ohio, or the Cooperstown, New York of, of racing. All the, the institutional memories of racing were housed in that building. Uh, incredible works of art. Um, and memorabilia, the silks worn by uh, Seabiscuit's jockey were on display there permanently. It, it was the Hall of Fame of, um, of racing in those early days. So and so it go. went up 
and the seventies looked like they would be, you know, would be bad for Baltimore and bad for racing. But then, uh, and nobody had won the triple crown in 25 years and then came secretariat. And the only way to describe secretariat, if you're not old enough to remember, is that he was like, he was like the Muhammad Ali of, of horse racing. No he had more charisma, more beauty, and more athletic skill than anything that had ever come before him. Yeah. So we've never of, we've never seen anybody win a race like he won his Belmont. His Belmont was 31, 31 lengths. 31 lengths. And yeah. I, I believe it was 31 lengths, but it, it was gigantic gap. And he, I mean, you know, when you think that he's racing against the very best horses in the world right there, and he just obliterated them, it was, it was incredible. So it really stoked the interest in horse racing. And then for whatever reason, it kicked off an era of several triple crown winners when there hadn't been one since directly after world war II. Yeah. So the, the, the after As three and we had three and five years secretariat, uh, and then Seattle slew and affirmed. Right. Yeah. And then, and then affirmed and affirmed was in some ways even more interesting than secretariat because he had a worthy, uh, opponent in Aladar. Yep. And so we just mentioned, uh, Muhammad Ali, but affirmed and Aladar were like Ali and Frazier. They had an <laughs> unbelievable rivalry that had been going on and then carried into the, the triple crown. And they, sure. I mean, each race was won by a tiny margins by, by affirmed. So going back to the what got you interested initially in this is Ronnie Franklin. Did you end up ever talking to Ronnie Franklin before, before he passed away? Or he was already in the hospice by the time I came into the story. And by the time the person who kind of cajoled me into doing it, by the time that person got me into his office to talk to him, Franklin died. So okay. it was between his initial phone call and when I actually went to see this man, Franklin died in between. Now, you and I talked off the air, but I'll just tell you, I happen to be a fairly decent friend of Tommy Meyerhoff, who was Harry's son. So the, without giving away too much, who are the cast of characters? If this were a movie, you've got the horse, you've got the young jockey, you've got Harry Meyerhoff, and who are a couple others? I know the trainer was Grover Delp, but... Tell us who were the main. I mean, you're, you're nailing it, Stan. Okay. It was it was this this magnificent horse, and then uh, Franklin, this kid from Dundalk, and then the the uh, the owner was Harry Meyerhoff, who was a developer. Yeah. And you know, and again, in case you're not old enough to remember it, from World War II on, developers to, were to Baltimore and Baltimore County what oil executives were to Houston. I mean, de development, I, I mean, almost everything outside of the Beltway was a uh, was cheap, inexpensive farmland. And so these guys came in and swooped in and bought land for nothing, improved it and made fortunes doing it. So Meyerhoff came from a family of developers. His uncle was was uh, um, Joseph Meyerhoff, who built the right. Symphony Hall, and his father was one of the founders of the Rouse Company. And so they'd been in the development uh, game a long time. Uh, Harry Meyerhoff and his brother Robert started their company. And these guys, and along with the other men in their industry, they basically built the Baltimore metropolitan area. So Baltimore was built and it was filled with all of our ancestors, our grandfathers and our fathers and so forth. But the Baltimore suburbs were built by these guys and they became um, rich doing it. So in addition to Harry, and then Harry's second wife, I think, was Teresa. It was Teresa Meyerhoff, who was right. like an ingenue. She was right. this beautiful young woman. So Harry, who I, you know, I look at him, he looks like an old man to me, but he was like five years younger than I am right now <laughs> during this whole thing. But he had this long flowing beard like Moses. And he was, you know, he looked like a substantial man. You know, he looked yep. like exactly like what he was, like a guy who knew how to get things done. And he was rich. He was, a, he was, uh, you know, he'd lost his hair, but he was a very handsome guy like you, Stan. And he, he was- uh, And me. And, and Gary. And so he was, he was a, and me in about two weeks. And he was, he was a very nice looking guy. And he had this, you know, he was married for a bunch of years and his marriage split up and he, he met Teresa and he fell in love with her and, and so would you. And so would Gary. We would all. I, th fall I think, and I'm not making fun of waitresses. I think she was a waitress. Yeah. And a bar waited on him down at Tyson place. I think it was uh, Oh Henry's. Oh Henry's. Okay. Yeah, on Charles street. Okay. And so they met in there, they fell in love and his yep. marriage fell apart. He ended up married to her and, uh, 
and uh, Tom was his son, and th those three were partners. And it really, ha uh, Harry had a long history of in horse racing that went back to the early '60s. I think I think uh, Buddy Delp was always his trainer, and then um, and then uh, you know he kept Buddy. He and his brother broke up as a partnership in owning horses. And he took on as his partners, his son and his new wife. And it was a way of just bonding them all together. And, and complete the puzzle of the, of the main characters. Tell us a little bit about your knowledge of Grover, quote unquote, well, let's Buddy Let's talk Delt. about Buddy for a second. You're, you're astute to ask because he's, he's a key to the story. Yeah. So he was the trainer of the horse and he was from, um, I don't know, like the Bel Air area or something like that. He was from up in Harford County. His father died. He drowned in a, in a swimming accident at a family reunion uh, when Buddy was about five years old. And his mother remarried about five years later, a man named Raymond Archer, who was a well-known local horse trainer. So he was kind of brought up in horse training, but he didn't really know much about it. He didn't really have much to do with it. Went into the Korea, you know, into the army during the Korean War, came out, went to about a year or so of University of Maryland. And he was like, I had enough of that. He wasn't really cut out for academics either. And he went in and joined up with Archer and became his trainer. Eventually, he needed to make a little bit more money. And Archer told him, see you later. I'm done with you. So he started out on his own. And very shortly, when he was still in his early 30s or late 20s, a fire broke out at Laurel, like a huge one. Yeah. And uh, uh, his, it broke out in the barn where all of his horses were. And so he lost something like 34 horses I think wow. the only horse of his that didn't die, I think there was one of his that didn't die. And out of all the other horses at Laurel, only two that died belonged to other people. Wow. And the, the thing almost struck him exclusively. It That's was an, it was almost story. like an Old Testament story, yeah. like, like Job or something like that. Like he was singled out. Well, literally the next day with literally the smoke still coming up off the ground, he went to the claiming races and started rebuilding his his uh, uh, herd right then, that day, the first day, the, the other trainers are making fun of him, you know, all speaking anonymously in the newspapers saying that he'll, you know, he won't be able to do anything because it'll be, he'll be making hasty decisions. Well, so this all happened in, I guess, in like uh, late October, early November, I can't remember. And uh, he ended up winning the most races of any trainer in, in uh, the state. Right. So, you know, it's, uh, what I said in the book was it would be like if your baseball team went down in August in a, in a, in a, a jet plane crash or something. and you brought up all your minor leaguers to take their place, but you won the World Series anyway. Right. Right. I mean, that's that's literally what it was like. And then even more amazing was you could say, well, it was late in the year. So he just finished out the year and won. But he with all these new claimers that he, he'd found, he won the title again the next year with even more victories. It was an amazing accomplishment. And it, it, it marked him early on as a brilliant, brilliant man. Yeah. So he uh, so that's who he was. Yeah. And so he when he, up his, he built up his stable, he was incredible at claiming horses and improving them yeah. and i mean you nailed it just like we would say in team sports you yep. know he knew how to pick them and he knew how to uh to develop them yeah exactly and, and he, he was really amazing so you know he had a huge reputation around here it was positive and so when this kid came to pimlico and they said hey we need uh you know he was coming to be a hot walker and so it was the delt family that came and claimed him and said okay you can walk hots for us and so he came and he struck up a friendship with buddy's young son gerald delp who was about three years younger than than franklin was and they became best friends. And then Franklin slowly but surely became like a member of the Delt family. Yeah. He moved into the house with them. So, uh, Jack, bring us back to Spectacular Bid in 1979 and uh, trying to win the Triple Crown. Basically, he won the Kentucky Derby and he won the Preakness. He was middle of the pack. He won it basically at the far turn. That's when he made the run and really won both races going away. I know he won the Preakness by about five lengths. I'm not sure what the Derby was, but what happened to him? What's the story when he tried well, to when he, when he went up to Belmont and tried to win the uh, Triple Crown? Let me take you back a little bit sooner, if you don't mind, Gary, because this is important. So in 1978, when he was a two-year-old, he won he won the Eclipse Award as the two-year-old of the year, and he he uh, and I told you what happened at the Laurel Futurity, and then he went to a race uh, in early 1979. 
um, called the, uh, the Florida Derby, a very important prep race for the Kentucky Derby. And so he had done great things uh, earlier on, but he ran into two rough customers at the, uh, at the Florida Derby. One was named Georgie Velasquez, who had briefly ridden the horse, and the other one was Angel Cordero. So Velasquez, for a while, you know, when, when it was apparent how good the horse was, Buddy had taken Ronnie off of him for two stakes races and put in, put in um, Cordero. Uh, Velasquez. No, Velasquez. not Cordero, Velasquez. Velasquez. And then he decided he didn't like him. Velasquez complained about, about uh, you know, he, that the horse needed special equipment. And Buddy looked at him like he was Roy Hobbs. He was the natural. He didn't need any <laughs> special equipment. And he certainly didn't need any advice from Georgie Velasquez. So they were pissed. He was really pissed that he got removed, which is something you need to understand about jockeys is they got hot tempers, they get, and they hold grudges. So his best friend was Cordero, who was the most magnificent jockey maybe ever. So they decided that they were going to team up against Franklin in this Florida Derby and they boxed him in. They got, they, they showed him an opening first Cordero did it. They showed him an opening. He went into that opening and then it was like a vice closed on him. Cordero came came in on him you know grinding him against the rail wouldn't let him get out and so he panicked and he pulled on the reins and then you know basically jumped to the outside got past him almost clicking heels with cordero horse and then somehow if you pull on the reins once that's usually it it's over yeah it's but hard somehow, to get a horse back going again no but but that horse was like a like a sports car. It was like a Ferrari. It was like he was jamming on the brake and then he was jamming on the accelerator. And the horse got to the outside. He goes zooming up to the front, catches everybody way ahead of him. And then what happens is is that Velasquez does the same thing to him. He suckers them onto the inside. They pushed him in. He panics again. He pulls the reins again. He found his opening. He leapt to the outside and then. Uh, and then again, he almost upset like five horses doing that. And he started zooming to the wire. Well, what happened was, and he won going away. He killed everybody. Well, at the end of the race, he, of course, he almost killed Spectacular Bid in the race. And so at the end of the race, uh, Buddy Delp comes running up to him on his way to the winner's circle and starts calling him profane names and screaming at him in front of the press and his parents and the, you know, the other jockeys. And uh, then he goes in and gets into a, you know, basically a fist fight with Cordero and Velasquez in the jockey's room. And he calls them a racial slur aimed at Spanish people. I'm sure you can imagine mm -hmm. what it was. And uh, it was ugly. It was, it was gross, but to a certain extent, uh, not understandable. It was, it was unforgivable, of course, but you could understand it came out of his temper. They, they had colluded to box him in and to, to harass him. And yep. he was angry. So that's you know that was so you know they considered removing him at that time but they kept him and then he ended up going you know he's on his way to the kentucky derby at age 19 and then and he won the derby and he, and he won, won the derby like this and but then a, then a controversial defeat at the belmont tell us about that well he was starting to become controversial before the belmont even he, he was starting to break down emotionally and he this, had, is, this is ronnie franklin ronnie yeah yeah he had a, a moment where he, he was caught kicking a horse at Pimlico, you know, and raced a few days after the, the Preakness. And he, um, uh, you know, he was getting into fights and he and Cordero were continuing to exchange words. And, um, you know, and if you were a close observer, you could see that he was starting to, you had to ask yourself, is this too much for him? But uh, they go to, uh, they go to New York eventually and they end up, uh, Cordero ends up plowing into him with his horse, uh, you know, like two days before the Belmont. It was clearly on purpose. And it was a terrifying moment. I mean, he, he uh, Franklin described it as though, he, you know, he could feel himself going down horse and all, you know, which I don't know if you guys can imagine it, but imagine all these gigantic animals with all this power kicking and running right over but, your head. But I mean, you're talking you know, about like in a, in a, in a training run. Yeah. Like a preliminary, practice. not a training. Yeah. No, it wasn't practice. It was a race. It was so, a race oh. two, two okay. days before the Belmont? Not only, yeah, because that's the way it is in horse racing. Not only do they run races, you know, two days before the Belmont, but they're running, most of the starting jockeys in the Belmont are running races in the preliminary races on Belmont Day. 
and and on Preakness. Oh, you mean, but but, but so he you, wasn't you on spectacular spectac bid. You don't mean spectacular bid. I was confused. No, not on spectacular yes. bid. Okay, I was, it, was okay. A race, it was a race for two year olds, okay. and so Cordero's okay. walking out to the to the race next to the uh, to the jockey uh, uh, Greg McCarron, Chris McCarron's brother. And uh, are we allowed to cuss on this show, or is that for bad? Yeah, you already said piss once. <laughs> okay. But try and keep it. Uh, within, uh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I will avoid the F word, but he's, All right. he, they're walking out, and Cordero turns to McCarron and he says, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, watch me, I'm going to drop this son of a bitch. So they, they <laughs> walk out to the to the thing, and right as, as the gates open, they, they were side by side, and he, bam, he plows right into them and almost takes them down. So they really had a thing for – Buddy Delp and Ronnie Franklin. They, well, they after did. The but, previous but the thing is, is that the trainers would never take the brunt of it. So Delp ran his mouth a lot. He said right. terrible things. He stoked it up. But they wouldn't carry out their anger on the trainer because they oh, oh, there were so few opportunities. Right. You have to I think mean, about the, that the way opportunities you, were very limited with the guys. The way you demonstrate what we're talking about here, pettiness and animosity, is through the jockeys, you know, through the jockeys. Yeah. So, and he was 19, you yeah. know, Angel Cordero was like 34. He was, he was a superb natural athlete. He'd been a boxer in his youth. He'd been a very good baseball player. He was pals in, uh, back in Puerto Rico with Roberto Clemente. And I think, I think, uh, Marichal, maybe, I can't remember who the other mm. one, no, it wasn't Marichal, it was somebody else. It's another great Puerto Rican ball player of the sixties. And he was a superb athlete and a grown man. You know, so uh, as you know, but Ronnie could hold his own with them. But, you know, but Cordero, I mean, a, a horse is a hard thing to beat in a fight. So, so and he wasn't expecting it. So as Gary was alluding to going into the Belmont, wasn't there one other thing that happened? Was it the day before or two days before that the bid stepped on a safety needle? No, it was the night. It was the night of. It was, it was so in the in the middle of the night or in the early we out small hours of the morning of the day of the Belmont he stepped on a safety pin okay. so the bid was uh, you know uh, the bid like many horses gets his legs wrapped at night for protection for, against like kicks or you yeah. know or or bites or whatever and so what they do is they generally wrap up the the legs and then in those days there was no velcro that they that was widely used they would pin them up. And then they would sprinkle peppers on it, and then they would tape the pins so to keep the horse from from uh, opening them up. Well, right. uh, the 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 groom, who was a magnificent groom, very well known and respected, forgot to tape the pins, and the bid opened one of the pins and supposedly stepped on it. Right. So that became a gigantic thing moment of controversy because a they should have reported it immediately, they didn't, and then b they uh, um, uh, they never said anything about it until like two days later. Okay. So, you know, there was a widespread disbelief in the racing community that it was true. All right. Now, get back to what Gary was asking, the controversy around Ronnie Franklin's ride in the Belmont. Well, so in addition to this uh, injury, true or false, he, he uh, gave an almost opposite ride to the one that he had given in the, in the uh, previous uh, two races. So instead of laying back and waiting for his moment to hit the outside and accelerate past everybody, uh, he, there was literally like a 100 to one shot ahead of him out there. And he, uh, and he chased him around the first turn to, you know, for supremacy to take it over. So he had a gigantic amount of, uh, of a uh, track left there. It's a mile and a half race by far the longest one. And, um, and so he, he got around to the, uh, to the second uh, turn, he's still in the lead, but then uh, the bid starts huffing and puffing on his way down the, the, the home stretch. And uh, eventually he's overtaken by another horse called coastal and he loses. And in fact, he not only loses, he finishes in third. Sure, yeah. So he was overcome by another horse by a nose right at the wire. So <clears throat> it was an unbelievable loss. And then a week later, you know, he had left to go and relax in Southern California. He visited with family, was supposed to be in an all-star event there. And uh, they went to Disneyland and he's out in the car, in the back of the car, chopping up cocaine when a policeman sees him and he's arrested. And so what happens is it all begins to spiral out of control for him. And uh, the horse 
he, he, the horse is taken away from him. He's given to Willie Shoemaker, the most famous jockey in the country. And he kind of, you know, falls in and out of racing and then eventually out of racing for good. And uh, his life really takes a sour turn. But there was a lot leading up to that bag of cocaine in that car that nobody ever knew. And not only did they not know it, but the reporters of the day never reported it, never asked about it, never looked into it. Everybody just took it that this 15 year old kid was to, to blame all by himself for falling into this terrible problem. Well, well, we'll look forward to reading the book and getting a lot of the detail, but tell us how, how did it end for the bid? Uh, in other words, Shoemaker wrote them, but not to that great a success, correct? No, or, no, to very, to very great success. Okay, I forgot so that, go ahead. So the, the bid only ever lost in the rest of his career after that Belmont Stakes. He only ever lost one more race. One more race. And that was a, uh, a race, I think, uh, where uh, he and Affirmed went head to head. And I think there was another, uh, Coastal was in the race also, and then a fourth horse. It was a four horse race, but it was really just a two horse race between Affirmed and the bid. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lost that one. And in fact, uh, Shoemaker, as great as he was, he was criticized by by buddy delp in that one too for not setting the pace for kind of almost the opposite reason and um and so they lost that race and uh and then never lost ever again All and right. and he had the highest winning he had a higher winning percentage than than uh secretariat did so i know gary's got a couple other questions but i just wanted to ask you of these two books i mean a book is for an author a book is like a baby did you love writing this as much as you did the Aninus piece? Yeah, and it, it, there was aspects of it that I liked more. Yeah. yeah, I mean, of course, Johnny, you was my personal hero growing up, and uh, I loved writing that piece, and I loved f walking in his footsteps and meeting his his henchmen and getting the stories. And Shula, you know, Shula to all of us. I mean, we all remember how how huge a figure Shula was in American life. But I think in in this piece. It was really fascinating. I mean, it was a mystery. It required an enormous amount of investigation to go in. I had to pretty much rebut everything that had been written about it previously. And, and it was all rebuttable. I mean, it was a very, very different story than the one that had been reported. And to unearth that and to set the record straight, I mean, it made me feel really good. It was like doing, you know, doing a mitzvah for somebody long yeah. after the fact. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, all of us as kids, we look at sports in a certain way. We don't know the backstories of all these things that we end up discovering as adults. You know, we look at hits, runs, errors, touchdowns, you know, uh, triple crown winners. All we know is the sport that they put out on the field or the turf or the court or whatever it is. I just wonder from your perspective, you know, as you grow into your author a life you know is it like how do you feel about uncovering the truth do you felt like you were lied to when you were a kid or do you think that it was just you know we're kids we're naive we don't really delve deeply into it well I mean I think that that there's not a story around that if you took the time to really figure it out yourself and unravel it if you did your own real true research on it that wouldn't be vastly different than what you believe it to be. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there's always something else there that nobody knows that you'll discover. I mean, as I wrote this book, uh, I began knowing less about it than anybody I spoke to. But very soon after a few months, I knew far more about it than anybody I spoke to. I knew more about Spectacular Bid than the Meyerhoffs did. I knew more about Spectacular Bid than the Delfts did. Or, or anybody in Ronnie Franklin's family did, because in the end, I was the only person with all the perspectives from the people who, who knew the animal personally and were in, you know, in the inner circle of what was going on. I knew all the perspectives, and uh, including some from people that weren't in the inner circle, but had very, very important things to add to the, to the story. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's really fascinating to do that research on your own. I don't think that there's a story out there that you think you know that you really do know. And then mm -hmm. if you're fortunate enough to write stories like I did for these two books, where many of the participants were still alive, it it uh, 
that's where you really change things because it's after so much time, people start to change their point of view on telling the truth. So for instance, ideally, I hate to say this, it's probably best when some of the main people are dead and some of them are still alive. Because well, that's, what, them, that's what I was going to ask you next is, is it more complicated when you, when you set out to write this, Harry Meyerhoff had passed away, Buddy Delp had passed away, and Ronnie Franklin passed away. I know you spoke to Tom, but how, so how, how does that skew you research? A story well, like this? it'd be great if you could, if you could take uh, Ronnie or Harry or, or Buddy and put them on the stand and have your Perry Mason moment with them and they would crack and tell you what they know. That <laughs> probably wouldn't happen. And not only would that not happen, but while they're still alive, the people that knew them best probably also wouldn't tell you what they know. Yeah. So in a way, when some of them have passed, but some of them who, who were there are Easier still for the couple that are alive to talk when the others yes. aren't around. They're more, more willing to kind of set the record straight. So for instance, one of the most important, there were two key people here. There were three key people here, but two of them were the fir fir among the first two I spoke to. One was Tony Cullum, who was Ronnie Franklin's nephew. And he started to tell me what he knew that, that Ronnie had confessed to him. He never would have done it if Ronnie had still been alive. Right. And then I took what, what he had told me and I'd gone to Gerald Delp next. I went up to visit him. He's living in North of Philadelphia near the racetrack up there. And uh, he had been through rehabilitation for drugs and alcohol. He, he, his lungs were ruined. He was waiting for a transplant. And he had a, you know, he had never told the truth of the story before. But yeah. he had a, a, a need to tell it now. So it just ended up being exactly the right moment. And let me tell you, trust me when I tell you, I mean, it was a, a deeply hidden story that emerged from all of it. I mean, it was a really fascinating story. Well, we'll, yeah. look forward to, we'll look forward to reading the book. And I know you told me that the working title is A Fast Ride. But I, but I got to tell you, when you used that phrase earlier in the interview, when you said, the bid, the kid, I think the bid, the kid, and one fast ride or something like that would really be great. I think getting bid in the in the title would be important. That's my mm -hmm. two cents. Well, you know, hey, Jack, uh, Jack, on that note real quick, let me ask you this, and this will be my final question. Um, you know, when you wrote the book about Shula and Shula and – John and Johnny Yu and the conflict there, you know, you're going to have a large part of the sports world, the sports fandom that's going to recognize those names, that's going to want to read that story, you know, that, that knows who those people are. They're Hall of Famers, right? But in this situation, you know, I, I would just say that your sports population is, is, is a lot smaller that's going to be interested in this story. But my question is, did you meet any resistance from the publishers to get it published, knowing that. That's a good well, question. I wouldn't think so, but go ahead. In a way, it's actually a bigger audience because even though you think of the NFL as the most, as the most, uh, you, you know, as this colossus that everybody loves and, and we look at Johnny U and we look at Shula as like Babe Ruth figures in, in football, but uh, the reality is, I think, unless you're writing about a New York player or a New York team or a Los Angeles or Chicago or maybe New England, everything else is looked at as the publishers as provincial. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard when you write about anybody except a New York hero to, to get what you want, unless you yourself are a major celebrity writer, which I'm not, obviously. And, but and, and with, you, with also, your, you also benefited, Jack, from the sea biscuitization of horse racing, which has made horse racing kind of That's romantic true. again. Yeah. yeah, but I would say that my story, let, let me compare my story to Seabiscuit for a second, because yeah. obviously she's a genius of a writer. She's a fantastic writer. Right, yeah. and I, there's no comparison between myself and Laura Hillenbrand. She, she's much better, and she's, you know, she's, she's a legend in, in that world, in the writing world. And uh, so there's no comparison there whatsoever. But her story of Seabiscuit, and my story of spectacular bid, her story is like Rocky, and my story is like Raging Bull. She wrote a deeply sentimental, uh, highly uh, um, uh, idealized portrait of horse racing, and mine was more of a, 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 a highly realistic look at yeah. what it was like, you know, the rage and some of the 
horrible things under the hood. Yours is like a black and white, and hers is like lush color. Yeah, yeah. Hers is like a, you know, like an old master's painting. And mine is, and mine is. I black really, and white. I really can't wait to read it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this. But Gary, you and I have been doing these interviews for several years on the TV show. I mentioned to him, I said, what's your next book going to be about? I told him about the, the, the story we had on the show, Dave Franklin, the runner. Oh, yeah. Villanova. Yeah. That got screwed out of his uh, 68 Olympic bid. That's a great story. Great story. Great yep. story. Yeah. Jack, I mean, we're, it, it, we're, we're big fans of yours. Uh, this book, is, it, is this book still available? Still Elizabeth available. Wills? Yeah, go to go to Amazon and, and buy it. And if you live in around here and you want it autographed, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to autograph for it for All you. Right. And when this is closer to coming out, we'll have you back on again and get into a little bit more different detail to it. But we're excited for you. Thanks, Stan and Gary. I gotta say I love seeing you guys and especially on a on a super cold winter night. It was a lot of fun. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. See hey, you guys. We'll see you later. All right, Press Box Live tonight has been brought to you by C3 American Exteriors. Go to their website at C3 America at, at excuse me, go to their website at C3America.com to get a brand new roof for just the cost of your insurance deductible. Gary Stein, I thank you as always. And it was really an interesting chat tonight with, uh, with Jack Gilden. Awesome, Stanley. Always appreciate it. All right. Love working with you, Gary. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. You too. Thank you, everybody. You got it. We'll see you Monday night with Ross Grimsley.